Thanks for all making it here. If you haven't already got a copy of this new translation of gender abolitionist texts into Croatian, then you should. Um, I know one of the people who has translated in it and she was very pleased to discover <laughs> that she features. Um, so today I'm gonna deliver a, a lecture called The History of Sex Hormones and the Stress of Gender, um, subtitle The Endocrine Revolution. And this is, um, this is sort of a, a sort of fused kind of Frankenstein monster of a talk because um, part of it's based on uh, a script I already wrote for a celebration of this man who is uh, called Percy Julian. And um, Percy Julian is a, uh, an, an African-American endocrinologist who did a lot of his uh, pioneering work exploring hormones, including sex hormones in Vienna. Um, he migrated from the US South during the Jim Crow era and actually found um, Austria a significantly less racist country at the time, how things change. Um, <laughs> however, he struck up a, a romantic relationship with a Jewish woman, which was of course controversial in Vienna due to the anti-Semitism, and then when he got back to the US South was considered a miscegenation, white-black relationship. Uh, <laughs> so he's a very controversial but very remarkable figure. And um, there was an artistic celebration of his life by uh, Cedric Falk uh, at a launch of a gallery called the Sophie Tapina Gallery in the first district of Vienna. And so I prepared, um, I prepared some kind of contextualizing work, which I've now merged with another, another piece. So this is kind of another preview. So I wrote a piece for Mask Magazine and I've um, kind of hybridized uh, a complete entity for you today. Um, yeah, so, so mostly I'm gonna be talking about animals rather than plants, which are, um, what Percy Julian worked with. So, so firstly, I'm gonna begin with telling you a personal story which hopefully conveys uh, the central role played by sex hormones uh, to human development. And this is my story, in fact. At age 20, I slipped on an icy pavement outside a London underground tube station, fracturing my right elbow, which landed underneath my waist um, in between me and the pavement. Uh, the doctors processing me described the injury as a shocking break and I was booked in um, for a surgery which ultimately took me six hours. I was unconscious for seven hours. Um, with the surgeon in charge describing my arm as pretty much pulped um, once they got inside, so like a juice. Um, so at present my right elbow, which is this one, uh, is held together by 14 screws, a plate and a wire. Um, but despite this kind of horrible injury, this, this injury that even kind of um, was quite striking for the medical professionals processing me, uh, I recovered mobility um, and uh, practical use of my arm so quickly that the physiotherapists uh, seemed pretty surprised at my progress. Although I was ferociously kind of like formidably well read on everything uh, to do with gender, I think even by this point in time, I didn't suspect myself as having an intersex variation until my mid-twenties. Despite this, in one sense, I've always, I've always kind of known this as a feature of my life, so my family never withheld that I'd been born with cryptoorchidism, that is internal testes, testes inside your abdomen, and that a small surgery had been required to fish these free. I can recall being told this uh, even as a toddler and already knowing this kind of as far back as I, as I have memories. Uh, and that didn't really cause me any concern until my mid-teens um, when a kind of a hefty, a hefty growth of fluid called a hydroseal um, caused me a cancer scare uh, and ultimately was kind of resolved through a further surgery, which kind of drained and reconstructed me. Um, yeah, at age 16, uh, unfortunately over the midsummer, which is quite bad timing. Beyond my own kind of personal, uh, my own personal anatomical experiences, I also knew that um, both my father and at least one of my uncles, I think perhaps two out of three, um, uh, had had related conditions. So there's a kind of lineage of intersex existence in my life. So in this way, I'd never really conceived of my body as kind of tidily sexuated, as sexuated without incident, and I'd always known about this aspect of surgical interventions, albeit relatively minor ones, um, and forgiving ones, which I'd kind of passed through. But despite this, this kind of limited knowledge, um, uh, in another way, being intersex was something I didn't even grasp as describing my own experiences and circumstances, and specifically as identifying me, even as I became kind of familiar with the, the plight of intersex people as an abstraction. 
This only came to change when around um, uh, age 24 I was embarking on gender transition after years of experimentation and regular so-called cross-dressing in public. Um, and, you know, I'd adopted gender-neutral pronouns with my friends uh, and so on and sort of suspended myself in this kind of non-binary life, which maybe, I'm not sure how it was read by those around me. So it was in this context, at the quiet suggestion of a partner, my first lesbian lover, at least at that time, even though we were both bisexuals, um, uh, it was in that context I began reading uh, through the symptoms uh, for Kleinfelder syndrome, so this is XXY chromosomes, and the presence of a second X chromosome, uh, as I already knew, causes a hormonal profile which is lodged somewhere between that you'd expect of a man and a woman, cisgendered, functioning correctly. Um, so yeah, rereading this Wikipedia entry, I found myself ticking off the symptoms one by one. When I got my bones and blood scanned at age 25 as part of the preparation for getting onto hormone replacement therapy, HRT, I discovered decisively uh, and objectively two things. Firstly, low testosterone uh, levels and slightly elevated levels of oestrogen, um, lodging my hormonal profile somewhere between that of an average cis woman and man but with overall much lower sex hormones than you'd expect from either. Secondly, uh, my joints were exceptionally narrow. My bones were narrow in general, but particularly on the joints. Uh, and this was to the point of osteopenia, uh, which was bordering on osteoporosis. So on a scale where like osteoporosis is 2.5, I was on 2.3 at age 26. After discovering this, uh, I began taking an oestrogen gel twice daily, as I'd been planning to anyway. Uh, and at this point, a few years down the line, uh, my bones are borderline healthy, fingers crossed. Um, and this is quite a common problem for intersex people, uh, as without one set of sex hormones or the other, your body just basically can't, your body can't digest and process, it can't break down the amino acids, the, the protein contents which it digests, uh, and this process called folding that fills out your joints and bones in general um, doesn't really complete. So this was only one of a range of, of ways of, that being born into sex really impacted on me. And in the full piece in Mask Magazine, I get into this a bit more. Uh, developmental dyspraxia, uh, having quite a feminine soft face uh, despite being tall um, for my age. This is one interesting um, feature of uh, a puberty completed out without the typical dose of testosterone is that you actually end up significantly taller uh, because that's actually the signal from the body to, to stop growing. Um, which maybe casts an interesting light on Napoleon syndrome. Um, right, so just despite uh, these changes, and then also kind of, uh, yeah, despite this kind of medley of, of differentiations, um, this kind of bone issue was the most kind of pressing, the thing that kind of confirmed my condition, uh, or variation, as we call it. So, um, the connection of bones to the endocrine system um, was kind of like something we were vaguely aware of, or, or physicians were vaguely aware of, even before the uh, endocrine revolution, which I'm going to describe to you today. So even in the 1800s, um, uh, surgeons were beginning to explore this kind of uh, lump, what's called the parathyroid, two growths on the main thyroid in your throat, um, which clearly had some kind of connection with bone disorders. Uh, a Viennese physician, physician in 1915 um, theorized that there was some kind of um, something to do with uh, growths of this gland, the parathyroid, um, and began to perform kind of quite rudimentary at this time throat surgeries to try and alleviate the bone diseases of this, these patients uh, beginning in uh, 1925. And um, yeah, in some cases, this resulted in a dramatic relief of the bone uh, disorder, uh, but unfortunately, in the first case, the patient still died seven years later. So I'm beginning this talk by discussing my own bones um, to give you a, a clear idea of why it is that I've been accumulating this knowledge, my kind of agenda. Um, I've never worked as a natural scientist. I've never passed through a medical school, so that's a, an obvious limitation. Um, nevertheless, I think this is a kind of like uh, phreniasis, like a practical wisdom or practical kind of knowledge which I've kind of been forced to accumulate um, in my circumstances as, as, a, as an intersex person and as a queer. And um, yeah, hopefully this kind of, this gives you some, uh, some kind, of, kind of idea of what, what I'm sort of getting at. For me, um, sort of my personal project of surviving and living a fulfilling life is kind of merged with and overlapping with this process of accumulating as much knowledge as I can about these conditions. 
and collecting fun memes as well. And this is this is kind of like a, a pathologizing, medicalizing depiction of of uh, Kleinfelder's syndrome. I like the IQ impairment especially. You can you can be the judge of that. Um, <laughs> But that's, uh, that's kind of brought myself into frame a bit. And now we'll move on to the next section. So, the, so I'm going to give you a partial history of hormone removal uh, and then replacement. So removal has a much longer history um, than replacement. In fact, it's a prehistorical matter. Let's see. Hmm. Back and forth. So right. Um, so this is kind of the section like what what is a hormone? In this most simplest form, like a hormone is is describing a signal uh, to the body that the body has to do something. With humans, it's divided between two forms, which are amino acids that dissolve in water and lipids, which are fat dissolvable. There's another kind which plants work with, but we don't have to worry about that today. Um, and yeah, the important thing to say about hormones, which actually I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll kind of, I'll push you through the, the earlier stuff first. Oh, we seem to have skipped a fair bit more forward than I was expecting to. That's okay. Right. Okay. So, um, right. Let's take us on to the next one, then we'll get back to this. Excuse me. So throughout human history, uh, humans have targeted sex hormones for their own purposes, experimenting on the bodies of both humans and animals to try and achieve desired outcomes. This, this happened prehistorically as part of agronomics, but um, uh, in which case, like you see the castration of livestock, particularly cows, um, in order to manage uh, in order to manage herds. So this is kind of a very sim like simple kind of eliminative understanding of hormones. Like we knew the body parts and we knew what they were doing, even if we hadn't isolated the chemicals in question. Um, this kind of procedure also extended into the treatment of humans. So throughout history, recorded history, gender categories have existed both for those um, who would later become known as intersex in the 20th century, uh, and those who are purposefully castrated, usually during childhood, um, to produce uh, uh, desired outcomes. So those in these position, uh, those in these positions, so eunuchs, hedra, and other people in these categories, um, usually had some kind of uh, specifically designated, in some cases, kind of elevated role, um, which uh, was twinned with them often causing discomfort to more con conventionally endowed males around them, um, who most of our source material kind of comes from. In cultures which were focused economic around, economically around households, um, usually there was some kind of prevention of um, people in this position from heading households in a conventional fashion. So this is true of uh, the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire afterwards. You didn't have any um, eunuchs as conventional patriarchs. Um, nevertheless, in various courtly cultures, such as Imperial China, um, uh, the Byzantine following into the Ottoman Empire, uh, eunuchs had a reserved role in the imperial administration and um, by contrast in cultures without uh, yeah so by contrast in in India where there were fixed property relations in family households we saw a kind of um, marginalization on on a, on a kind of dual level for hedra so they, they didn't tend to have an ele elevated civic role um, but instead were kind of usually associated with uh, mystical practices superstitions and so on so the important thing to say about this kind of body modification on humans was that they were focused on removal. So castration could ensure a new developmental trajectory for children who are subjected to it. Um, but with this said, the process can also be considered to be more of a positive one. So for example, in Catherine Ringrose's book, The Perfect Servant, she explores how in the Byzantine Empire, eunuchs were socialized as part of their gender construction um, and associated with particular distinctive attire, mannerisms, and other features, which suggests that there was a distinctive way um, for people left in this position to kind of live out their lives. And when I talk about like uh, this including intersex people, this is sort of a matter of speculation. We do have biblical references towards eunuchs who are born as eunuchs, um, but we don't exactly, we, we have no idea about the exact composition about 
who, who had had surgeries, who hadn't, or, or whatever. So despite this, throughout these many centuries, the processes at work were only dimly understood, um, even while they were routinely manipulated. What changed in the 20th century was that previous processes, which were focused on removing hormones, came to be uh, augmented through a, a much richer understanding of human development, especially after the discovery of the endocrine system. So this kind of takes us on to uh, section two. And um, yeah, and this is kind of like the boom of the boom of hormonal research. But firstly, I just need to, to like get in a little bit more to this question of like the guts because guts are really important when it comes to hormones. So um, for a physiologist, when we talk about something being visceral in a literary sense, we talk about saying visceral is saying like deep inside of us, right? That's saying which is like our bodies are composed of our viscera. Um, but physiologists have this funny and very distinctive view where something which is inside your, your digestive tract, something you've swallowed, is actually not inside you. Um, that, that is something which is simply passing through you. Um, it's when something gets digested, when it passes out out um, through uh, your large intestine into your bloodstream or through in, into whatever, then this is the process. This is the point at which um, this is the point at which you're actually talking about something inside of you. So a hormone is like an internal secretion, um, to use the original original um, phrase, uh, and that's something which is kind of like in your in your in your actual system itself. So this is kind of like a, a weird visualization just to get your brain kind of bent a bit because um, physiologists have a funny outlook usually. And we're going to get a bit more into how they went about things. So, um, so basically, there was this there was this boom uh, which began um, noticeably in the first half of the 20th century. Um, at which point, uh, there were major discoveries in terms of the chemical building blocks that were understood at first in uh, very kind of general, abstracted terms. But then, by the mid 20th century, um, in more concrete terms, um, identifying these kind of uh, malleable keys which. Um, would link together various glands. So a gland is just like a concentration of something secreting a particular hormone, um, which previously, as I kind of described to you, were sort of understood in terms of their dysfunctions. Uh, they were understood in terms of ways they would break down, uh, but not understood in, in the terms of normal regulation um, that they were performing. So this is the point at which we started to understand, um, like in, in the early 20th century following, like theorization in the, uh, in the 19th, um, we see this kind of, uh, yeah, it's a boom of hormonal research that begins um, firstly in like 1901 with the isolation of adrenaline and then ca uh, carries on through to 1958, which is the year uh, melatonin, the sleep hormone, was identified. So this is kind of like a less than 60 year stretch um, during which um, one uh, discovery after another um, started to be made. So. Um, this was always a process which involved uh, experimentation with animals. So the first, um, the first discovery was uh, the, the two adrenal glands, and these were discovered as a kind of like on-off switch for the whole, whole hormonal system. Um, unfortunate animals would have one gland or the other pulled out of them, and then they would die soon after, showing that this clearly had some kind of crucial role um, in the system. Um, and then by the end of the 19th century, further animal experimentation had revealed kind of insights and speculation about this, this idea of a core functioning state of homeostasis. And this is what the whole field of endocrinology uh, then gets born out of. So adrenaline, as I said, was the first one. So in, in 1893, a pair of London physiologists had identified a substance that was contained in the adre adrenal medulla, and this was, this was found um, to be possible to extract, and then when you inject it into a dog, the dog's heartbeat would increase. Um, so uh, the, the compound was then isolated in 1897, and then finally, um, in 1901, we saw adrenaline itself um, identifying, beginning this, this rapid uh, set of changes in scientific understanding of the human body. The term hormone itself was uh, then first suggested by Ernest Henry Starling, um, a British physician, at his Croonian lectures to the Royal College of Physicians. A classics enthusiast, Starling adopted the Greek word hormoa, which uh, basically means a substance uh, or a thing which begins, urges on, irritates, stimulates, and excites, or irritates. So there was kind of like a profound meaning which Starling sort of baked into this word. 
And we still kind of see this reflected today when we talk about someone being hormonal, at least in the English language. This is a way kind of dismissing someone, usually like a woman or perhaps a teenager, of being kind of overwhelmed by their passions. So there's a kind of like double entendre in the word itself, which still kind of retains in our language. So this is kind of a list of stuff that got discovered. And um, best known from the endocrine system, I think on a mass level, are the testes and the ovaries, um, which were now identified as producing um, various sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen in its three main forms, and then also progesterone. But um, one thing I'm going to run through today is that uh, a lot lesser known um, and, lesser un and less widely understood than this is that there are actually like glands um, featured across the bodies, these concentrations of uh, hormone emitting um, organs, um, which have a range of functions. Um, so we have um, things ranging from the hypothalamus, which connects the endocrine system to the nervous system. Um, so that, that kind of uh, tethers hormonal regulation depending on sensory inputs to the pineal gland which um, as I mentioned produces the melatonin, me melatonin the sleep hormone um, the thyroid which has a, a wide range of metabolic uh, metabolic functions from controlling the heart heartbeat to weight gain and um, right the parathyroid I've mentioned it's control of bones um, thymus which is a, a child like it's a, a feature of um, the children a, a, a child's developing immu immune system and then the adrenals which uh, again were one of the first things covered and both produce adrenaline and corticosteroids which I'll return to uh, and then the pancreas which produces um, the um, two blood sugar hormones insulin and glucagon so what's most important for my uh, talk's purposes is that for the most part um, for the most part, this, this, this is a kind of system which is shared irrespective of, of sex. So whatever your gender um, identity or position, your pituitary gland is going to produce a small portion of each sex hormone. Um, and for the most part, this system is kind of responding to um, signals which affair in a kind of, uh, uh, will, will impact on you in, in a way that's just sort of ir irrespective of what are, what, what else you've going, got going on. So the first therapeutic uses of all of these, these discoveries was not really anything to do with sex hormones, but with, was um, cortisone, one of the stress, stress hormones, um, which it turned out could reduce inflammation of the body um, when applied to people um, in need of that. And then, of course, insulin is the most famous example, so this is what keeps like uh, large numbers of diabetics alive. Right, so, so at this point, when I was kind of doing this research, I began kind of um, to become a bit fascinated with this um, sex irrespective aspect of the endocrine system. Um, so of course I turned to the trusty like biological textbooks which people will always refer you to when, it, when you start talking about trans issues. Um, and I found that they kind of really struggle because of course biological textbooks are rarely kind of written by queer theorists or the, the illustrations at least don't seem to be. So there's this kind of like queer dimension of this system which I think kind of comes across in the various ways that um, you either see these features kind of merged or twinned um, in these depictions, which are always twofold. So here we have a pretty basic one, which is just like sharing the terms between the two sets of bodies, um, except for, of course, the ovaries and the testes. So this is about as inoffensive as you can do it. I mean, they're both white, but nevertheless, good effort. So this is the first, like, this, uh, yeah. So, so these are kind of like racially ambiguous. I, say, I would say perhaps they're Asian, but again, you've got kind of like a shared, shared database of words and the brain as well. The brain is like gender undifferentiated, which is at least nice. That's like progressive. Um, but you do have these big kind of male and female signs. So that's a bit like, yeah, it's a bit problematic, but, um, <laughs> But again, I would say this, this, is like a, this is like a strong, like seven out of 10 kind of effort. Um, right, and, and this is probably the most offensive one, where you basically just like, well, this is a male system. And then also you could have ovaries, which would make this person a trans man. So we can say that's inclusive, but, um, but still, okay. So they've, they've kind of clotted it with lots of different information, which is quite useful. But yeah, this is very much like, yeah, male centering. Did, do you want to look at that one some more? You get the picture. Um, yeah. And then this one is like, 
like more, yeah, like, I suppose this, this one's like racially diverse, right? Anyway, but, um, but yeah, once again, we get this kind of like, we get this, um, we get this kind of shared, uh, shared vocabulary kind of being mapped across various different potential formations. So as the endocrine system was discovered, both the basis for existing developmental differences, uh, which occur across what we would usually call male and female adolescents, uh, came more clearly into view, um, and at once so did prospects for making calculated alterations that a given individual might find desirable, or the medical establishment around that individual might find it desirable, I should add. Um, so I'm going to move on to talking about hormone replacement therapy for the rest of um, rest of my talk. But this is in reality only one intervention which we have now um, come to know of. Medical science has identified major changes that regulating uh, part of one's lifestyle, so for example your sleep pattern, um, avoiding night shifts when you're at work, uh, getting one exercise, uh, one hour of exercise a day including like walking, um, we've discovered there are various ways you can get your system working in a much more efficient and a much more orderly fashion um, just by um, making sort of obvious lifestyle interventions which kind of for the most part we knew were good or bad for you anyway like we've always been familiar with heavy drinking being bad for your health but, um, but now we know the kind of devastating impact um, exposing yourself to alcohol can have on your entire uh, hormonal apparatus so um, so there's lots of kind of like ethical uh, changes which we um, now have a kind of stronger underpin underpinning of, uh, of uh, and, and can kind of understand on a more kind of enriched level. Um, but I'm going to focus, as I said, on HRT um, because this is kind of a point of struggle. This is kind of like a point of contention. And this is one place where we can see, um, yeah, we can just see the, the, the varying potential um, interpretations and like reimaginings like these ones um, kind of begin to play out on a more um, important level. So, um, yeah, so, so obviously, obviously this, this discovery of the endocrine system provided a unique opportunity for gender transitions uh, as we know them today. So a regular dose of exogenous hormones could allow patients or self-medicators to drop one set of secondary uh, sex traits uh, in favour of another, to kind of oversimplify things slightly. Um, however, the best known uh, application of this, um, of this breakthrough in terms of uh, reproductive um, capacity is hormonal contraceptive, um, co contraceptives, which are more simply known in, Eng in English as the pill. So this discovery um, followed on directly from the isolation of progesterone. Progesterone levels were found to be uh, high throughout pregnancy, with this being a key signal to the body um, that it shouldn't shed its uterine lining. The pill's inventors simply achieved a balance that could um, fool or spoof the reproductive system into maintaining activity as if it was already impregnated. Um, strangely, from my perspective, uh, cisgendered and uh, cisgendered kind of contraceptives and trans HRT, uh, as well as actually like um, the hormone replacement therapy used by cisgendered women, these are usually kind of kept as isolated, um, separated topics. Although in reality. Um, there's only so much variation in terms of the key ingredients of the pills, gels, injections, and so on uh, administered to untold millions of women and teenage girls um, around the world. So, for instance, I've got um, estrogel on this on this um, slide, which is widely available in Austria. It's also what I use, um, but it's primarily used by elderly women. So you can find it basically at any pharmacy um, you go into. So, um, so yeah, for for trans women and for um, people in various other positions, it's interesting that there's just like some kind of combination of these two drugs, um, estrogen or estradiol specifically, uh, and progesterone, which is in play. Um, so, yeah, but, but for some reason, the most controversial um, of these outcomes, although of course the Catholic Church has done its best to problematize um, hormonal contraception along with all other forms, um, yeah, quite handily, uh, the most controversial aspect of it was the birth of today's uh, transsexual. Right. Um, now, uh, a kind of, a kind of like, a t because, exactly because of this um, reliance on the same fundamental substance, 
um, we see this kind of threat which happens at once to kind of untold millions of elderly women who are trying to avoid osteoporosis after their uterus is shut down, and also trans women, um, originates from the same um, position. And this is, again, to do with animals. This is to do with, like, animal extraction. Um, so early... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. This is just like a... This is just a little, basically, a recipe list of what goes on in gender transitions. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's the basics of it. Um, Okay, so the initial um, initial effort to mass market estrogen um, was drawn from um, the urine of pregnant women. Uh, this was obviously kind of an impractical and quite a difficult um, means of extracting estrogen. It was quite difficult to, to scale. It did at least have the advantage of um, coming from the same species, but it quickly became replaced by a product called Premarin. So Premarin, um, as its name suggests, is drawn out of pregnant mares. Um, and it was used alongside other synthetic variants, um, which were kind of in the same way that like synthetic um, marijuana tries to kind of uh, synthesize the experience in a very unsuccessful way. Um, synthetic variants of estrogen were trying to do the same thing. Um, a string of studies began to find that um, due to the balances of uh, the hormonal levels in both premarin and synthetic um, approaches, this would kind of elevate the risk of uh, cancer, mental health conditions, uh, and other various kind of undesirable outcomes um, for uh, women on HRT. So that's either trans women or cisgendered ones. In the face of this, doctors became increasingly cautious, especially from prescribing doses high enough um, to keep l levels equivalent um, to younger women. Um, so you would get a, pre a pregnant mare, a pregnant um, horse. So this is like the procedure they, they would do. They would basically milk the uterus of a, of a um, pregnant horse. This is still available. Like Premarin is still, um, still available despite giving you cancer and being very unethical to extract. Like it's still out there. Um, but it came to be superseded by bioidentical um, estradiol. So basically they um, now are able to um, produce... Uh, what, yeah, what's called a bioidentical um, form of estrogen. And um, initially, like, this was done through plant extraction, which Percy Julian, uh, who I kind of flagged at the start of the talk, um, was one of the experts in. Um, but at this point, they were also able to synthesize this. So um, for reasons that are kind of unclear to me in the face of um, this medical research, which was demonstrating uh, the carcinogenic properties of both synthetic and horse extracted um, estrogen, doctors responded as if all estrogen was dangerous. Um, <laughs> which is, I don't know, there, there's something going on there. But, um, but the upshot was, uh, yeah, rather than simply elevating levels to the same um, degree using bioidentical um, estradiol, instead they started to look for kind of alternatives to, um, well, in the case of um, elderly cisgendered women, they simply would give them like lower doses and, and hope for the best and say, well, you're old anyway, so maybe you can have a much lower level. Um, in the case of trans women, things worked a little bit differently, which I'm going to get to now. So, next section, spironolactone and cortisol, deprivation and stress. The scare over Premarin in the 1980s and 1990s um, was to have a knock-on effect on trans health care, which is still being felt today. Whereas earlier approaches to hormone replacement therapy had often administered a high dose of, est uh, um, of estradiol, the outdated belief that even um, these bioidentical estrogens um, would elevate these risks um, led to the development of a new best practice. Um, in this new approach to trans HRT, doctors would offer only a low dose of estrogen um, and in many cases would come to favor pills over injections to better achieve these kind of low, low levels they were looking for. And doctors would add in the use of an antiandrogen. Um, antiandrogens are intended to directly switch off uh, the male gonads in one way or another. 
in many cases, this would actually cause an excessive reaction. So many trans women today, particularly in the United States, um, have lower levels of testosterone um, than average cis women do, like sometimes even levels of basically zero, unmeasurable levels. Um, so uh, cisgendered women, at least prior to menopause and minus any intersex conditions, um, will tend to produce a small amount of testosterone um, through their ovaries. Um, and like a hazardous range of side effects tended to appear along um, with this state of affairs because um, once again, if you have a low level of estrogen and no testosterone, then you're effectively starving um, your body of the, of the kind of fundamental stuff that it needs. Um, so in Europe, the situation is a little bit better because uh, a drug called Androcor um, uh, tends to be used and this can be used for a short period of time and then you can wean off it because um, it closes off the uh, gonadal activity kind of directly. Um, by contrast, in the United States, um, we see a rather worse fate uh, befalling women. Um, the most commonplace drug used there is spironolactone, and um, spironolactone is a diuretic, so it makes you urinate more, um, which in itself kind of causes problems in terms of your potassium levels. Um, but beyond these kind of more obvious side effects, like we've got some memes here about cravings for pickles, um, which is kind of one of the upshots. So when, when your shit, when your um, yeah, when your potassium levels are spiking, you start to crave salt in particular. So people like like go after pickles and stuff like that to try and balance out their levels on some on level of craving. Um, but beyond this kind of more comedic, like amusing kind of level of problems, um, which has kind of made spironolactone central to lots of trans meme culture. Um, a string of research papers into both animal and human populations has shown that spironolactone also has a major impact on um, cortisol. So cortisol is one of the two main, uh, one of the three main um, stress hormones. So I'm going to read you a, a piece from a recent, uh, a quote from a recent piece in Briar Patch, which is a left-wing Canadian magazine. And it kind of uh, gives you a, a vision of how this plays out. Um, a glimpse, anyway. Faith's endocrinologist suggested that she start on a regime of 100 milligrams of a drug called spironolactone. After three months on spiro, uh, Faith would start her estrogen, so total hormonal deprivation for three months. Um, spironolactone is an anti-androgen that reduces testosterone so that the body is more receptive to estrogen. But Faith's blood work suggested that her, base, her baseline levels of both testosterone and estrogen were already quite low. Antiandrogens can cause side effects ranging from liver damage to weakness to mood swings. Taking them without any other primary sex hormone in one system, some trans folks say, exacerbates these symptoms. None of this information was shared with Faith, however. And even after increasingly higher doses of Spiro, multiple blood tests showed that her estrogen levels continued to be low. When I saw him three months later at the next appointment, he prescribed me uh, 2 mg more of estrogen, she says. Then I did some blood work and my estrogen levels were low, so he decided to bump up only the spironolactone to 200 milligrams, then later to 300 milligrams. Faith says that she began feeling very weak and fatigued. She didn't understand why her doctor had her on this dosage and he didn't explain it to her. Even a 50 milligram daily dose of spiro, uh, as we've seen some doctors will go as high as 400 milligrams, uh, increases the level of the stress hormone cortisol, which is a close relative of cortisone, as I've said, which is another, another of the drugs which Percy Julian worked out how to extract from plants. Um, but high levels of cortisol are associated with any stressful activity. So for instance, if you have a, a dog barking at you, or you're living in a war zone or whatever, your levels will temporarily or over the longer term tend to spike. Um, but taking medication which continuously elevates cortisol levels can be thought of as continuously keeping the body in a state of alertness. And this is, if you're interested, you can take some notes, just various papers demonstrating the same um, spironolactone cortisol link. Um, so the impact of these elevated cortisol levels is not only depression, but generalized cognitive impairment, brain fog, and anxiety. Under this stress, the entire system of hormonal regulation comes to operate differently. Spiro has been shown to reduce breast growth and high levels of cortisol are also associated with a, gro a growth in visceral fat, so deep fat around the belly, um, which is part of the human survival process uh, in times of plight, but is also notoriously hard to shift. So this is kind of like your extended 
fight or flight mode um, outcome, the body is continuously taking emergency measures to protect itself, beginning with the vital organs. Needless to say, this is not the kind of desirable outcome of feminization which many trans women are looking for. Um, right, and yeah, so for me, kind of, it's, it's like a pretty dreadful thought to think of a population that's already under a degree of um, unique stigmatization, shunning, and marginalization, having then heaped on top of this uh, condition another chemical handicap. Um, and it's very likely that symptoms of prolonged cortisol exposure are underreported, given how stressful the lives of trans women are anyway. Um, right, so another approach to hormone replacement therapy has been developed by the trans community ourselves. Right, so um, this kind of brings us this kind of brings us to a, a little a little Facebook group, um, which I've been a member of for a little while, <laughs> and I'm quite fond of. Um, so right, so the Facebook group in question is run by an activist called Beverly Cosgrove, and um, it's called the uh, the um, HR, Trans HRT Support Forum. Uh, and more recently, Beverly has also started a blog entitled Modern Trans Hormones. And this, this kind of group um, specifically champions um, uh, their own kind of like, their own kind of best practice about how to go about these things. So basically they champion in injections and aiming for uh, an estradiol um, rate of 250 to 500 um, PG per milliliter. So this triggers what's called an aromatase reaction, which causes the body to regulate itself when it realizes these um, estradiol levels are, uh, are reaching high by kind of spontaneously scaling back on androgen outputs. So this circle of trans women discovered that administering these higher levels of um, estradiol, which their physicians would kind of warn them against explicitly, um, particularly using intramuscular injections, produced rapid results, um, which they'd been unable to achieve um, on the standard approach. Now this kind of still remains under-researched uh, as trans people are a very difficult population to build up a reliable positivistic sample size from. Um, and many doctors have proven quite resistant to this approach, um, even in some cases tending to scaremonger, so warning their patients about these cancer risks, which are actually based on another type of chemical, as we've established, um, and in some cases even claiming that the excess estrogen is going to turn into testosterone, which is actually chemically impossible. Um, if you're interested in these things. Um, so right, I've included like, often when I give these talks, I feel like I come across as like super like, um, super negative towards the medical professional uh, profession and like it, as if I, I kind of hate all doctors, but really it's just most of them. So there are some good ones. Um, and, and this is kind of one of the figures in question, Dr. Will Power, who I think at this point has like a thousand trans patients um, uh, no exaggeration, and um, he's kind of done some work on accumulating this kind of best practice and taking it sort of out of the internet and into um, medical care. So right, so this this kind of organisation is really is really something which um, which has become of interest to me because I think it's just kind of an extension of the sort of organization we always see among LGBT circles um, in the face of widespread medical neglect and kind of um, systematic kind of ingrained or even non-systematic just kind of um, routine kind of unthinking um, incompetence. And um, yeah, the final section of my talk is gonna move on from talking about stress hormones to talking about testosterone um, because there's been a lot of interesting research done on testosterone, and I'm going to um, make some comments about it. But firstly, um, actually, I just said I was going to move on from stress hormones, but I'm going to I'm going to show you one more one more section about this, and then move on to the mystification of testosterone. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to show you a video clip by Robert Sapolsky, who's an evolutionary behaviorist. Um, and he's going to talk about his early research in this clip. He's more recently um, done a uh, book called uh, The Problem with Testosterone, which is what I'll move on to talking about in the next section. But here he's just going to talk about his um, time with a troop of baboons. very deep. So you get some 
big male who loses the fight and chases a sub-adult who fights an adult female who slaps a juvenile and knocks an infant out of a tree all in 15 seconds. So insofar as a huge component of stress is lack of control, lack of predictability, you're sitting there and you're just watching the zebra and somebody else is having a bad day and it's your rear end that's going to get slashed. So tremendously psychologically stressful for the folks further down in the hierarchy. One of Robert's early revelations was identifying the link between stress and hierarchy in the bones. Some of move troops are over 100 strong. Like us, they have evolved large brains to navigate the complexities of large societies. Survival here requires a kind of political savvy, with the most cunning and aggressive males gaining top rank and all the perks. Females for the choosing, all the food they can eat, and an endless revenue of willing rumors. Every male knows where he stands in society. Who can torture him? Who he can torture? And who in turn the torturee can torture? Sounds like a weekend in Berlin to me. Well, it sounds like a terrible thing to confess after 30 years, but I don't actually like that rooms all that much. And there's been individual guys over the years who I absolutely love, but there are these skinny, backstabbing, Machiavellian bastards that are awful to each other. So they're great for my science. I mean, I'm not out here to commune with them. They're perfect for what I study. 22 years ago, at the age of 30, Sapolsky's landmark research earned him the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Fellowship. His early work, measuring stress hormones from extracted blood, led to two remarkable discoveries. A baboon's rank determined the level of stress hormone in his system. So if you're a dominant male, you can expect your stress hormones to be low. And if you're submissive, much higher. But there was an even more revealing find. In Sapolsky's sample, low rankers, the have-nots, had increased heart rates and higher blood pressure. This was the first time anyone had linked stress to the deteriorating health of a primate in the wild. Basically, if you're you know, a stressed, unhealthy baboon, then a typical truth, high blood pressure, elevated levels of stress hormones, you have an immune system that doesn't work as well, your reproductive system is more vulnerable to being knocked out of whack, your brain chemistry is one that bears some similarity to what you see in clinically depressed humans, and all that stuff, uh, those are not predictors of a hale and hearty old age. 20 years ago, Robert got a shocking preview of this idea. The first troop he ever studied the baboons he felt closest to and had written books about suffered a calamity. It would have a profound effect on his research. The Kinkarok troop is the one I started with 30 years ago. And they were your basic old baboon troop at the time, and which means males were aggressive and society was highly stratified and females took a lot of grief and your basic off-the-rack baboon troop. And then about, by now, almost 20 years ago, something horrific and scientifically very interesting happened to that troop. The Kikarok troop took to foraging for food in the garbage dump of a popular tourist lodge. It was a fatal move. The trash included meat tainted with tuberculosis. The result was that nearly half the males in the troop died. Not unreasonably, I got uh, depressed as hell and pretty damn angry about what happened. You know, you're, you're 30 years old, you can afford to expend a lot of emotion on a baboon truth, and there was a lot of emotion there. For Robert, a decade of research appeared to have been lost. But then he made a curious observation about who had died and who had survived. It wasn't random who died. In that truth, if you were aggressive, 
and they were not particularly socially connected, socially affiliated, you know, spending your time grooming and hanging out. If you were that kind of male, you'd be gone. Every alpha male was gone. The Kikarok troop had been transformed, and what you were left with was twice as many females as males, and the males who were remaining were, you know, just to use scientific jargon, they were good guys. They were not aggressive jerks. They were nice to the females. They were very socially affiliated. It completely transformed the atmosphere of the troop. When male baboons reach adolescence, they typically leave their home troop and roam, eventually finding a new troop. And when new adolescent males would join the troop, they'd come in just as jerky as any adolescent males elsewhere on this planet, and it would take them about six months to learn we're not like that in this troop. We don't do stuff like that. We're not that aggressive. We spend more time grooming each other. Males are calmer with each other. You do not dump on a female if you're in a bad mood. And it takes these new guys about six months and they assimilate this style. And you have Babylon culture in this particular troop has a culture of very low levels of aggression and high levels of social affiliation. And they're doing that 20 years later. And so the tragedy had provided Robert with a fundamental lesson, not just about cells, but how the absence of stress could impact society. Do these guys have the same problems with high blood pressure? Nope. Do these guys have the same problems with brain chemistry related to anxiety, stress hormone levels? Not at all. It's not just your rank, it's what your rank means in your society. the average person in there, don't bite somebody because you're having a bad day, don't just place on them in any sort of manner. Social affiliation is a remarkably powerful thing and that's said by somebody who lives in a world where ambition and drive and type A-ness and all of that sort of thing dominates. Those things are real important and one of the greatest forms of sociality is giving rather than receiving and all those things make for a better world. that bad wounds teach us is if they're able to in one generation transform what are supposed to be textbook social systems sort of engraved in stone we don't have an excuse when we say there's certain inevitabilities about human social systems and so the haunting question that's enough of the hollywood voiceover so um, Robert, Robert Sapolsky, um, author of books like The Trouble with Testosterone, um, I, th I think pretty clearly, pre clearly presents uh, across his career how social phenomena such as um, stress uh, play out both on a chemical level and with groups. Um, and what interests me especially is how this is quite an incompatible view with those who make uh, appeals to biology as if it were somehow immutable, as well as incompatible with people who try and center um, testosterone as some kind of essential um, fluid, which is key and, and is like central, <coughs> indispensable um, to manliness. In this view, um, male behavior is very much something which exists as um, a, net, a networked kind of uh, social fashion, even in um, uh, baboon culture, never mind human. And um, and I, I, I kind of, I, I took a big interest in Sapolsky recently, and, and especially, um, especially because I just wasn't quite getting the satisfying answers I wanted about, um, about this, the, the various ways that testosterone just kind of seemed to keep on appealing. Like for instance, in the Facebook group, I mentioned, I've had at least one thread <coughs> closed down for being too philosophical, um, which I don't hold against them. Um, but it seems like to me, <coughs> with this interpretation, we kind of have an explanation at once for why um, doctors in the United States are so keen on a model of HRT that focuses on f uh, flushing and purging the system of testosterone, but also for why um, this particular substance has come to have um, such a crucial role in far-right ideology. Um, although it interests me a great deal how um, there is at once this kind of radical interpretation which is presented here about the um, potential flexibility of um, social structures in light of what we now know about the endocrine system. But then on the flip side, um, Canadian 
uh, psychologist, crackpot, um, YouTube personality Jordan Peterson um, makes arguments which use the exact same material and then, and then flip it in the other direction. So he says, look at the serotonin levels in lobsters and we can see that hierarchy is inevitable and hierarchy has always been there for billions of years. So this is basically the same, the same material evidence which is just being completely having a conservative um, slant put on it. Although, of course, um, Peterson knows a lot less about lobsters than Sapolsky does about baboons, that's safe to say. Um, so anyway, this is kind of, the, this is kind of the, the impasse we're left with. There's like this essential view of sex hormones, um, which is out there, and then there's a more kind of critical, flexible, social one, um, which we can also develop, and I think we should develop. Um, right. But I, I guess I just want to move, I, I, I want to quickly quickly introduce like like the other ways this this, this is kind of playing out um, on the alt-right like this, this conception of like the soy boy I don't know if any of you are familiar with soy boys but I've, I've written a piece about it called an anatomy of the soy boy if you're so inclined um, you can explore this so this is the idea that like um, left-wing men according to the contemporary far right based on the internet are kind of like these bearded underdeveloped lo low T kind of, kind of creatures who've ended up ended up in this horrible position because they haven't they haven't like had the sufficient um level of testosterone in their body which they need and here's a soy boy biology which actually this this in, this includes very little biological data it's mostly sartorial critique um thick rimmed glasses and <laughs> facial expressions and god awful fashion items and so on um <laughs> including a cafe which maybe they'll wear um yeah, so the only biology here is actually the hairline and the patchy beard. But anyway, this is what... This Excuse me, which is actually proven to be the result of uh, too much testosterone. What is? Receiving uh, hairline, like losing hair on the... On the um, that's to do with DHT, yeah. Like, it's to do with a specific... Yeah, D, uh, yeah. Right, so it, it doesn't make any sense um, on any level. Another thing they believe is that... Um, they, they believe, yeah, the, 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 the word soy boy is because they think soy products have estrogen. Est estrogen, estrogen, right, which they do, but plant estrogen is like up to a thousand times less powerful than actual estrogen. So um, if you're actually going through real HRT and you're using herbal HRT, um, it's not going to work as well because your estrogen receptors are getting clogged up with the plant stuff, um, which your body can't process because... You know, we can't even digest it, we're not herbivores, so like, most of it's not even getting in, into your um, system out of your large intestine. But, um, right, so this is why you shouldn't rely on 4chan for your, your biological information. Um, TLDR. Okay, um, so I think, um, I think with that, that dispensed with, um, my last section is called New Horizons for Hormones and Sex Expression. Um, this is then. This is the weird kind of up, the, the 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 other side of the soy boy is like a, a gender identity which only seems to exist on 4chan, and that's um, people who are using um, various kind of pioneering approaches in um, HRT, which are kind of they're just experimenting on themselves to try and have this kind of prolonged. Um, basically, they're trying to transition without becoming a woman, so without growing breasts and so on, and they use various different um, cocktails of things um, which have never really been tested. Um, to try and achieve this. Um, yeah, and they self-describe as femboys, and you can't seem to find them anywhere other than 4chan, so that's the thing which, which kind of intrigued me, that at once you had the same website producing hatred of effeminacy, and then also people who are consciously cultivating effeminacy at the same time. When I say people, I mostly mean kind of like teenage, teenage um, femboys, early 20s um, men who are trying to sustain that youthful appearance for as long as they can. So, right, that kind of leads me pretty nicely into um, New Horizons for Hormones and Sex Expression. So, I've tried to be a little bit scientific so far, but I'm going to end with a trans-feminist rant, um, if that's okay with you. So, mastering hormones with medical science will only be um, possible to a certain extent, um, uh, in particular because people only tend to realise these things about themselves consciously. Um, as they age, as they develop uh, into adulthood, um, and as such, like this is this is only ever going to be a limited, um, a partial aspect of trans liberation. This is never the entire answer. 
And in fact, as I've described, many of the groups in question are not looking for a complete answer. They just want drugs that work uh, and they don't care about philosophy. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that makes them powerful in a way. Uh, but discoveries from the last century, um, uh, to take a historical perspective, were still kind of absorbing the uh, first half of the 20th century in many ways. Um, but in terms of endocrinology, we're still coming to realize how features that had seemed um, more fixed or only able to alter in the most crudest, eliminative ways such as castration, are in fact possible to direct um, as a form of human expression to a greater or lesser degree. These breakthroughs have previously been limited um, by the hierarchical domination uh, of knowledge, particularly through the medical profession, uh, an especially conservative one. Um, but today, trans people can work um, with our limited allies within the medical and research communities uh, to achieve what it is that we need to do. The subversive potential of these breakthroughs um, is kind of being responded to by those who instead choose to interpret things in an oversimplified, and I would say purposefully oversimplified fashion and in a conservative fashion. Um, these kind of perspectives uh, present uh, in particular, testosterone is some definitive elixir, um, as we already discussed, not even understanding the basic um, changes it makes, um, such as influencing height and so on. Uh, and they want to see this whole uh, endocrine break breakthrough as like the final vindication of the male-dominated household, um, as well as the male-dominated street. Unfortunately, uh, a fair amount of um, these kind of perspectives have even kind of soaked into trans circles. So for example, you'll read about, um, you'll read people talk about testosterone poisoning, you know, as if, as if testosterone is some kind of like uh, toxic, crucial substance rather than just one thing uh, that makes people grow in certain ways. Um, increasingly, uh, increasingly in popular debates around transition, um, we've seen the media uh, fail to kind of grasp this fascinating history and an ongoing struggle. So for instance, at the moment, there's lots of debate over whether teenagers should be permitted to transition, um, kind of operating on the assumption that there's any way to stop a kind of willful adolescent who has an internet connection from getting hold of what they need to. Trans HRT is a field where objective breakthroughs in understanding of the human body meet a powerful agency on the part of trans communities of various different flavors to overcome the dysphoria which we've experienced throughout our lives. And so we should now come to accept that the future looks like mostly unqualified or underqualified nerds working things out for themselves using PubMed, SciHub, and in-house pharmacy, to name only three websites. Um, and we are still today only in the early era of seeing what wonders, breakthroughs, and undoubtedly horrors those well-read amateurs are able to devise. <laughs>